Here we go. This is impromptu, sort of, kind of. <laughs> yeah. So hi, everybody. It's Lisa Sonora from Visual Journal Studio, and I'm here with Sandy Smith, who is a student of mine at Visual Journal Studio. She has blasted on her own through pretty much all the classes I offer, and she's been, and she still is, in the six-month immersion process with me. And I've just really loved getting to know her. She is a coach and a, how did you put it? A communication director. Coach? Yes, I'm a communications director at a foundation. And also I do communications and leadership coaching. Fantastic. Good. I knew you could say it better than me. You could communicate it better than me. I'm so thankful that you're willing to share so generously about your process with visual journaling. You mentioned to me that you're also an artist and you started painting and drawing about six years ago. That's incredible. Tell me a little bit about that and then how you got to doing visual journaling with me. Yeah. Well, it's so fun to be here. Of course, I'm a little nervous, but I'm super excited because I love your work and what you share. And it's just been so helpful for me. So I'm happy to tell everyone. Um, for me, um, my sweetheart is an artist and a cartoonist. And one day I saw him looking online for yoga poses. And I was like, what are you doing? And he said, well, one of my colleagues wants me to draw some yoga poses for him. And I was like, but they're not all in your head. And he said, no, I have to go online and look up yoga poses. And I realized I always thought artists just had everything in their head. And so I was like, huh, well, I want to draw the ohm symbol. And so then I spent a couple hours learning how to draw the ohm symbol. And then I was like, I want to learn how to draw everything. And so then I just started signing up for classes to learn how to draw. And my first year I did classes with kids, just learning, sitting next to seven and eight year olds, learning how to draw. Amazing. So you, yeah. do, you were doing that in person. Yeah. That, way back when. Yes, yeah. That's amazing. Person. Yeah. That's Mona incredible. Brooks Art Studio in Berkeley is where I went first. And then you got into doing some visual journaling. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how you found my classes. Yeah, you know, I was actually looking good old Kindle shows you like I bought your creative entrepreneur book like eight years ago or something. And, you know, just thought it was so cool how you used imagery. But I actually started learning visual journaling through Eric Scott's work, which I talk about some on my blog. And I really was like, wow, I can put anything in my journal because I've always written ever since I was a little kid. I have my journal from when I was nine years old. And I, when I moved from Philadelphia to the Bay Area, I brought 30 pounds of journals, but they were all words. And so as I started bringing in imagery, I was like, oh, I like this. And then I came upon your work and your classes and I started doing your classes. And then I was like, oh, I can bring in magazines because I felt like I had to do everything myself. And so working with you helped me see that it doesn't just have to be an image that I make. I can bring in any kind of image and allow it to be compost for me. So that's been amazing. Yeah, we think of that as ephemera or creative compost. And we're using the magazines in our own work and not selling prints of other people's exactly. photographs. So we're using it in a more private, respectful way. I'm curious because you do use collage a lot in your visual journals. Can you tell us a little bit about your thought process, if there is one, or do you have a method behind your magic with mm. making collages in your visual journals? Collage is new to me. This is something that I only have started doing in the last year. And mm -hmm. it really is in large part because of you and the work with you that I started putting together images from ideas, right? So that like some of the prompting around like, what's your vision and where are you going? And, you know, how a spread around, you know, my voice, like that is influenced by doing those exercises in the seven creative powers. And I have one moment where I'm like, 
oh my God, this was so amazing to just pull all these things together, put them on the page and then ask them, what do you have to tell me? Like, I just was like, this is incredible. So can you tell I'm a total addict about it? <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad. So am I. So we're, in, <laughs> yeah. So am I, I mean, I've been visual journaling ever since I can remember basically and teaching it now for more than 30 years at this point. My favorite thing in the world is to be able to see people's visual journal pages. And it's a delicate matter because the way I teach is really from the inside out. It's an interior process. Me, and we we take the word journal seriously. If you think about it like a private diary for everyone watching, these are our diaries. They happen to be visual. Mm -hmm. When I started teaching this to other people, I didn't know what to call it. I never, like there wasn't art journaling or anything at the time. And I just thought, well, what is it? It's a journal. It's my journal and it's visual. And I had always had this habit of working in sketchbooks because I didn't like lined paper. I felt very constrained by it. Yeah. So even if I have visual journals that are less visual and more writing there's still those blank artist mm -hmm. journal or artist sketchbook pages and I just love those kind of notebooks sharing your images with us it is such an act of generosity because we do I do encourage people to keep their process private because as soon as we're thinking we we're making art to show other people everything gets shut down and the inner critic goes crazy so if we have a way to keep it to ourselves, and then after, long after we've created our pages, mm -hmm. we can decide and choose like you have, mm -hmm. which images am I comfortable other people seeing mm -hmm. and for what purpose? You know, I would never allow someone just to sit there and look through my sketchbook. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they'd be prepared for what. They... <laughs> so, but it is hard to find images that I'm willing to share. Mm -hmm. So, so it is a delicate thing. And I, I noticed that on your pages, you, you not only do a lot of writing in your images, but you have some unique ways of forming your letters. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, including what materials you use to do your lettering. Yeah. Mm. So I love words. I mean, the way that I've identified myself and my artistry has been words as a writer. That's how I have identified most of my life. So when I first started drawing and painting, I was kind of like words get back. And I just was so excited to be in this other realm where I was seeing something and not judging it, but drawing it and painting it because what I find is that writing can be so judgy, like before we even think twice, we're layering on this web of judgment through language. So I just loved separating for a while from that. And then um, probably, I don't know, six months ago or so, words started saying, but it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to be so judgy. Let us in, let us in. And so I was like, how do I do that? How do I bring the words in, in a way that is part of the art making? And the lettering comes, you know, I, did, I played around. There's a woman named Ann Luke who has a really fun sketchbook journaling class. So I did some of that. And that got me starting to play more with how I make my letters and drawing them, just slowing way down and drawing the letters and so I just started practicing that and playing with it, but not calligraphy. You know, I didn't, I decided I didn't want to feel like I had to make perfect letters. I like that they're wonky and strange. And then I like to also bring in a color behind them. So if I make them uh, open letters, like block letters, then I can put color in between the letters and have really lovely backgrounds. I love that. It's so fun. And then I also like to use Pentel brush pens sometimes to make super thick letters. And then I'll add serifs on the bottom. So I play with Uniball pens, like the 207s. And this one, the Uniball, whatever that one is, <laughs> Vision. And Pentel brush pens and Posca markers. 
when you said you put the color behind the letter, so would you kind of ink it in the black lettering and then add the color with the brush mm -hmm. pens or so like first or do you add the would, color first? No, I do the color afterwards. If I make a C, if I make the letter open, then I, I leave the letter open, but I make the color in the background and the letter pops forward. Oh, okay. So maybe tracing around the letter a little bit? With the color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With the Pentel brush pens. Or the or a Posca marker. Okay. Right. So there's one spread that I, I shared with you that has, it's a lot of lettering, but there's color behind it as well. And so I made a bit of a light background and then I went back and added color in between the letters. You know, as I explain it, I'm like, wow, there is a lot to it. It is a process. Right. And it's not, it's not obvious how we create our pages. And I just, I love to give people at home watching tips for how they can do it. And of course, we always want to know what kind of pens we're using that write over paint, because that's tricky. I know. <laughs> so the Poscas are so great because they're acrylic and they no. write over the paint really well. And then the Pentel brush pen also works over the paint. And then I guess you what I could share is it's helpful. Here's an example where I wrote the letters, but I have a background first and I write the letters empty and then I can use paint in between them. Mm -hmm. And that's how I can get that effect. It's really interesting how you're just making your letters free form in all different shapes and sizes. So that's another takeaway. I think this is a wonderful antidote to the fear of putting our own handwriting in our visual journals. There's this fear that I've heard from people. I don't want to mess up my pages, but what if you tried to make your letters wonky or big or small or like something you've never seen before, then it becomes your art. Exactly. And it's a way to slow down, right? Because um, as I'm doing the letters that way, I'm really savoring the letters. I'm savoring the letters. I'm savoring what they mean. And sometimes they tell me something I didn't know they were going to tell me, right? So like I was doing this thing around juicy justice. And as I was writing juicy and justice and juice, I was like, wait, juice is actually in the word justice. And I was like, oh my goodness. But I would never have seen that. If I hadn't slowed way down and was making these big letters and being in the letters. So Ooh. it's also just a way to generate awareness, right? And definitely um, curiosity. Yeah. Slowing down, taking your time um, and just attuning like that. That's what I mean about this being an inner process. We're really developing the skill of listening inward almost like you would if you were trying to meditate or something. And I think of this often as meditating with art supplies. I'm a longtime meditator as well. And when I was learning to be a meditation teacher back in my 20s, um, I was sort of rebellious that I, I, I would always have art supplies at my meditation classes. <laughs> All my students and I would make these little treks to the five and dime drug store in the middle of rural Wisconsin, where I was studying and go buy all the kids art supplies oh, and make visual fun. journals. It was really fun. Mm. So you mentioned at the beginning how this process helps you. What I would love to know, is there any particular way how or how are you using it to support you, whether it's in your work or your creativity? How, how is this helping you exactly? So I made notes because... Whoa. <laughs> because it's really been amazing. So I'll share a couple things. You know, one has been just the process of slowing down and bringing in images gets me noticing things I wouldn't have noticed before. And so I have this sense of my source being connected to, and instead of it being a trickle, it's like this whoosh, amazing gush that comes through me and the gush holds insights, ideas, noticings. I mean, the okay, 
the whole process of observation, right? So you teach about the observant mind and the creative powers. So what is that, right? It's a protocol. What did you notice? What feelings came up? What thoughts came up? What was easy? What was hard? And what are your takeaways? So doing that as I was doing the journaling pages got me doing it when I'm in my office, right? Or when I'm on a Zoom call or when I'm reflecting back around a reaction that I had, just quickly doing that protocol gets me more able to respond in a way that is aligned with how I want to be. Mm -hmm. So just that awareness means I'm showing up in more of the way that I value and I want to show up. And it shows, right? I get feedback very quickly, like, oh, you are so calm. Oh, wow. I really appreciate what you brought to that. So that's one, right? Just the slowing down the intentional observant mind on the pages translating to my work. But then another one is the harvesting, right? So I tend not to go back and look at things like I'll write and write and write and then not look back at them, especially just writing. It's not even that fun to look back at. So, you know, you make it very clear, like even, you know, having your coffee, just look through your book. Well, the more I would do that, the more I would notice that something I was wondering about now, there was an answer in my pages. And I would be like, what? You know, I would be thinking about a blog that I would, wanted to write. And what am I thinking about fear and how to move forward through fear? I'm going through my pages. Oh, look, I wrote all this stuff about fear. And oh, there is this amazing quote from Audre Lorde. I'm tingling as I say it right now. It's like, oh, right. And then I can type, there's my blog post. It's like it was yes. already held in the pages of my book. Absolutely. Yeah. So amazing. And so then in my work life, I'm also harvesting more instead of just like going through day, 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 I'm stopping and looking back at what it is that I thought about, what it is the notes were. So it's bringing that habit of harvesting into my life. And then the last thing I'll say at this moment, well, is perfectionism. Oh yeah, let's talk about I, that. <laughs> uh, so when I started doing the seven creative powers, like there's one, you know, you're making your image for the, um, the overall book. And I was spending like hours because I would work on it. Then I'm like, I don't like how I did that. Then I would try it again. And when I did the observations, I noticed the whole perfectionism thing. And then I did another spread. And when I did the observations, I noticed perfectionism. And then I did another spread. And then I'm like, what is this? What is this? So I started noticing the feeling in my body of wanting to have something be perfect, which I hadn't noticed before. And so then in an encounter in work, I noticed that feeling in my body about wanting something to be perfect. And I said, uh-uh, I'm going to move through this in a different way. So I just, what I see is how the pages are a rehearsal space for noticing these deep patterns and emotions and ways of being. And because I've slowed down enough to catch them, when they show up in other realms, I see them and I have a strategy for working with them. Mm, that's so powerful. That's amazing how you experienced perfectionism as a feeling in the body and made that connection and then how it reflected in another situation yeah wow and then I started making image making imagery in my book like perfection is a prison right it's like I started just realizing how it constrains me like what it's doing to me and so that is also powerful right because People talk about perfectionism for them, right, in the abstract, but for me, right, this allowed me to see what it does to me so that I can 
step out, right? So that I can break free. And I think that is one of the gifts, right? Of doing the work. It's not received wisdom. It's earned wisdom, right? It's created wisdom from yourself. And that is amazing. Definitely. So amazing. And, and that's why I love visual journaling. I first started teaching it to the patients I had. I worked as an art therapist in psychiatric hospitals. And I really hit a wall, <clears throat> even though we were doing art therapy and music therapy, I did hit a wall because we had talk therapy groups that I led with their families and et cetera. And I just felt like, I don't think anything I've learned in school mm. as a therapist is going to help me help these kids. And so I just had this epiphany one day mm. of bringing in visual journaling supplies and we weren't allowed to self-disclose in that therapeutic mm. environment, but I kind of did break the rules. And I said to them, you know, I don't know how to help you guys, mm. but I really want to, and I'm kind of at a loss. So I want to show you something I do and what I did to feel better when I was sitting where you're sitting. Mm. And that got their attention that I even said that. And I said, I can't say any more about me. Mm. We're going to just talk about you, but this isn't really therapy. This is just something I do that helps me feel better. That helps me explore things. And I can teach you how to do it here. And we did, we had this whole process we went through together and they had something they could take home with them. Mm -hmm. And also the visual journaling process gave us a framework to talk about all the issues that no one was really talking about in therapy. Cause mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to get teenagers to talk anyway. Yeah. And that this just opened up such a great conversation because we could talk about what, what's happening on the page. So that's where that really started. And I think of the blank page as a metaphor for our life. And when we have a personal creative practice that we can do, that it doesn't have to do anything with all the kind of art constructs like talent or, or ability or all these things we judge, talk about the judge and perfectionism, yeah. where we can go really explore and experiment and play. I always encourage people, just put your five-year-old self in charge and see what will that. happen. So people will say, I don't know how to draw. I'm assuming you don't know how to draw, you know, most people yeah. that come to my classes are not professional artists and I'm not a trained, you know, professional artist either. So, um, but if you don't know how to draw, then there's nothing to lose. Hmm. And just having that joy and fun and place to experiment. I love how you made that discovery that perfectionism wasn't just something, a mindset something mm. mental, but it was a physical, visceral experience you had in your body. And that the visual journaling process helped you make that connection. Yeah. It, but it's so important, the observing piece, right? So two things. One of the things that I appreciate is there is a rigor to it, right? So you're not just, which is already awesome, right? But you're not just throwing paint down. You're not just bringing images in, you're not just writing, you're also taking time to look back at it and reflect on what it meant to you, what showed up. And there's a rigor, right? What you notice, what you feel, what you think, what was easy, what was hard, and what did you take away? And I know when I first started hearing you talk about the takeaways, I was like, I don't know, I don't know. But that it's not, it's not a forcing, but it's a prompting, right? It's just like, well, come on, give, give me something. What is some takeaway? What is something? And again, just having that active engagement, right? With your work, but also with people. Like when I go to an event now, I'm like, what's my takeaway? I ask different questions, right? In a, I just went to a beautiful book reading. Like I ask different questions because of this process that I'm doing with myself. And then the other thing is it's also affected how I think about learning. And I'm someone mm -hmm. who's always, always had lots of books. I love books. I love reading. I love learning. And I also see how there was a bit of a superficiality about it. It was still kind of like, well, they're the ones who wrote the book, but now I have more of a, I'm writing my book in, yes. in relationship with them. And so I'm use I'm 
harvesting what I read and what I hear in a different way, just as I'm harvesting my own journal. So it's super cool. Yeah. One of the exercises we do, and we play on this word authority and the word author, that you're the authority of your own experience and you're the author of your experience. Mm -hmm. You're the author of this visual guidebook coming from inside you, from your wisdom, from your soul, for whatever words you use about your inner life. How miraculous is that? And that, that was my dream. I remember thinking, you know, we, cause I love to travel and it's like, well, I can buy a guidebook to Paris, but what about a guidebook to what in the hell I'm supposed to be doing with my life? Mm. And this is a way to have that guidebook. And as a coach, it's such a wonderful tool that you can do with your clients because we can talk and then we can make, mm -hmm. you know, and I work with my own coach and I always make visual journal page spreads based on what my coaching session was. And it just helps me keep extracting mm -hmm. what I got out of it. In fact, all coaching lessons or ideas you give with your clients could be turned into wonderful visual journal exercises. Yeah. You know, which well, I've cool. already started bringing this into my coaching. First of all, just in terms of those seven C's, right? And making sure there's the container and the calendaring and, you know, the commitment and the clarifying the whys. So I brought that into even the setup. And then I yep. also just love that whole thing around anticipation and how do we support people to feel excited about what they're stepping into. So yes, I definitely am working with that iterativeness of what, of what is here in the visual journaling process that I can bring to coaching and vice versa. Yeah, definitely. And the, the education piece, I'm glad you noticed that I love studying critical thinking processes and how do you help people think critically, but also feel critically or know what they're even feeling. And mm -hmm. so a lot of what I've learned uh, is definitely woven into how I teach, including that seven C's you're talking about is a framework that we use to plan events or workshops or our own process. And I like to just make things easy to understand and remember. And also very visual because when we're in the visual, we're using different parts of our brain and different mm -hmm. ways of knowing than just the logical in your mind. One other thing just... Going back to what you were saying about going to events or the questions you were asking at the book signing and asking yourself, what's the takeaway? Another fun thing I love to do, and this probably won't be unfamiliar to you, is you can kind of take that ahead of time. Even when I'm doing a work project, sit down a moment and just imagine what, how do I want to feel when I'm working on this? Or if I'm leading a meeting or having a conversation, how do I want the other person to feel? Not that I'm in charge of them, but what do, what do I hope to create? What's the intentionality behind what we're doing? For someone who's curious about visual journaling and maybe is having objections, I don't know if you've talked to people and they have objections about art, or maybe you could say what some of the objections are and how you would encourage them just do it anyway. I think to start with where they are. So, you know, I have a friend who's, who told me she liked collage, but hadn't done it in a long time. And I was like, oh, that's great. So just get a notebook, put some paint on it and some collage. You know, someone else told me that she liked, she used to like to paint. I was like, oh, great, just get some paint. So I think that part of it is doing a little listening and hearing what it is that's actually making people curious. Because what I find is when I show people something, like I show them one of my notebooks or a couple spreads, like they wanna know more. And another friend is really more about writing and she just wants to write. And but then she was like, I do kind of want an iPad. I was like, okay, I'll show you how you can use your iPad for that. Mm -hmm. So I think some of it is just helping people see that it's really not that big a leap to do it. Yeah, it's not something you see people do every day, keep visual notebooks or, you know, Leonardo da Vinci left us some examples of that and he had his own way of doing things. And 
you know, I keep learning more about that process. Like, why did he have all kinds of random subjects of mm. on one page? Mm -hmm. There was a practical reason. He didn't want to waste paper. You know, back then, the notebooks, paper, like that was a really precious commodity. And it's and it's like, wow. So we could we could play like Da Vinci might play. You don't have to have a separate page for every idea. What if you just put all kinds of random ideas on one page? How would that look? All the things you're thinking about. Um, I have all these like financial calculations on one of my pages. And now I want to go back and just like draw monsters or something. Some of what I shared with you is from the journal that I did around the root process. And for mm -hmm. that one, there's almost no drawing. I just have like a sheet of from a magazine that covers the writing, but it was an image that I liked, right? So that's also something that I've shown people. It's like, you don't have to draw anything you don't have to no. make anything it's just like more like gluing and collecting so yeah just making the 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 uh threshold low the low bar in fact um some other people i'm talking with in this interview series they have their visual journals that they've done in those school composition books mm -hmm. so you don't even need fancy paper or anything like that. So, well, thank you so much, Sandy. Maybe we'll come back and have more conversations. Who knows? <laughs> this is all this is all an experiment. If you are watching and like this video, give it a thumbs up, please. It really helps YouTube and everyone find content like this and um, consider subscribing if you want to. And in the description box below the video, there are notes and links about where to connect with Sandy and her work and her website, her gorgeous blog. And she's written some other articles about her visual journaling experience. If you want to read more, it's awesome. And then she's mentioned several different of the classes she's taken with me. And I'll have links to all those also down in the description. So thanks so much, Sandy. And thanks to everyone for being here today.